Come on, Palomino. We're having national here tomorrow. Mikey's also also been on the standards That's committee, so, cool. so he is the national perfect national person national. to talk about Palomino's, a breed that I love very much. Go ahead, Mikey. Okay. So for this one, I don't really have a PowerPoint. Um, Stacy asked me to fill in for a, an extra spot here and said, well, Palomino Nationals are here, let's talk about Palominos. Um, and I didn't really feel right going and asking for rabbits or searching the internet to find steel pictures for because I'm supposed to judge at least part of them tomorrow. And I, that, d that just doesn't look good to be uh, snooping around for rabbits. But I did end up with a rabbit, but I'm, I was completely prepared to do it without. Um, but you're doing open. So and this is a, okay. Yeah, so okay. A See, I didn't know that until just this very moment. Yes, I knew I was doing some of them. All right. <laughs> so what I did is I, I just went through my standard and I marked a couple of things um, that I wanted to kind of talk about, point out on these rabbits. Um, and I'm just going in order of the standard here, um, not in order of necessarily importance of what these these things mean. First off, check those weights. Um, all of our commercial six class rabbits, palominos, Californians, satins, they're all in the same basic range, but they do have some slight differences from one to the next. And palominos especially are golden senior bucks. Golden senior bucks, you will find some very nice, really typey, really well balanced that are just right on the line of that eight pounds. Um, so it's always a, a good thing to keep that in mind. Um, the next thing um, is our high point. This is something to me, this is as much of a distinguishing characteristic of this breed as is the beautiful colors that we have um, in the breed. Um, so what it says, we all, I, I usually tell people that the um, high point's at the front of the hip rather than the center, but actually what the standard says, we want to be correct with the standard, high point is to be uh, even with the back of the toes when the rabbit is posed properly. Now we know where, the back, where those toes go and it accord, you know, goes up with the front of the hip, but um, so talking back to posing, again, we've really got to have that proper pose, those rabbits set right, um, and those toes where they belong so that we can correctly evaluate where that high point um, should be. That high point being in a different spot um, obviously is going to change the top line of the rabbit. We're not going to have quite as much depth in our hind quarter as we do on the rabbits. Just, I mean, obviously if that high point kept going further back, we'd have more depth over the hind quarter. But that does not mean they, they are flat over the hindquarters, they slide off, they chop. We still want a well-rounded, deep hindquarter to them, just bringing that high point a little bit further up. And um, these guys, don't be afraid to talk about the high point being too far forward still, because I see a lot of them that, let me, I'll kind of fix a pose here, that'll actually kind of peek at the back of the rib cage even, come up too far. Um, to it. Just because it's further forward than most of our commercial breeds doesn't mean it comes all the way up and gives us that sliding off appearance to the hind quarter. How would you evaluate that one's top line and placement of high point? I would say it's high point maybe just a tick far forward, um, but the overall depth is lacking. So um, not too far off on the actual placement of that high point, but not high enough to it. Um, let's see. Point three. This is something I found very interesting. I don't really know if I'd, I'd noticed this part in the standard. I raised Palominos for, for many years. Um, so we, if we look at our points, we've got general type as 55 points. We don't break it down any further than that. Um, and the thing that I found interesting is here under fault, it says cut severely for heavy bone. Um, which is kind of interesting because it doesn't say cut severely anywhere else um, in the type faults. And so I mean, obviously, I, I wouldn't just knock them to pieces because they have that that he, uh, super heavy bone. But um, it, you, you can justify taking a pretty big cut if it's it's listed with general type and there's 55 points there. Um, so um, very interesting on that. And I think there's probably two reasons that is in there. One is um, especially on the Goldens. We had a big problem with crossbred New Zealands. We were getting too dark a red. We were getting too, and getting really heavier boned rabbits because New Zealands, these guys are going at eight pounds on their minimum. Um, New Zealands are a pound heavier on the bucks um, and a pound heavier on the does as well. So that extra bone kind of correlates with that. So that's probably one reason. And the other reason is um, tying back to my meat pen conversation. Um, 
I, I won't go into that, or, or Alan will pick on me more. Um, I but, won't pick on you. <laughs> Um, but again, we don't want we don't want super heavy bone on these. We want enough bone to carry the size of rabbit that we're going for. So I, I, that's just a kind of an interesting little uh, thing, and I think it's in, uh, even more interesting that it says cut severely for that. Um, so we've got a flyback coat, and I'm not gonna. You can read the first standard in the front um, for yourselves. Um, I'm not going to overanalyze that, but um, it's only 15 points, but that's one of those things where the, that 15 points counts a whole lot more um, than what it's actually showing us because right after that we see that color is 25, and if we've got an unfinished, uneven coat, that color is not going to show off for us as well. So um, uh, do comment on the coats, do make sure we're aiming the, the breeders in the right direction because with those nice crisp finished coats we show off the color, the paramount feature of this breed, all the better. Um, so now we'll get into the color. Um, interesting enough, this was our, our first variety of Palomino. The, the Lynx came first and we called it Fawn back then, which was honestly and truly probably a better name for it. Um, but here we are. Um, and they were called the Washingtonian. That was their original name. I'm glad they changed that part at least. Um, <laughs> Palomino is a much prettier name. Um, one thing I'll mention before we get into the talking about the description of color, um, mismatched toenails. Check it. Um, it's not a super common thing, but it's not super rare either. Um, if I judge a really big class of Palominos, um, like I guess I'm going to do tomorrow, um, I would be surprised if I didn't find any. Um, I'd feel like I maybe missed something if I didn't ca catch at least one or two um, in a, a decent sized class that had some mismatched toenails. Uh, to them. So um, talking about our golden, we'll have to use our imagination, but we will talk about it. Um, bright golden uh, or uh, bright golden uh, orange color to it. Glossy is used in that terminology. Um, like I said, when I started in Palominos, um, we had a lot of problem with brassy red colored uh, rabbits that really more approached the New Zealand. And I Again, when we, we look at these fault standard, uh, the faults in the standard, um, it's interesting that we say cut severely for dark brassy red or reddish surface color, but then just a regular cut for um, pasty, flat, dull color, that more washed out color. So if we've got two rabbits that are fairly equal, we judge by the standard. If we've got one that's red, one that's a little washed out, we want to go toward that washed out. Obviously, in the middle is where we want, um, but uh, all things equal, the uh, the red one should be faulted more severely. Um, lynx, which we've got here, this is a color um, that eh, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of debate, there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. We we see lynx on every other breed of rabbit, and we find a true agouti pattern. We blow into that coat, we've got really distinct crisp rings, um, or at least aiming for that anyway. Um, but this is not the case for a lynx palomino. A lynx palomino really is a fawn. I mean, we've, we've got, um, when we blow into it, we do have intermediate color, and the standard does address that. Um, what I think is the key word in that, that first part of that description is the, uh, so we talk about the surface color, medium pearl gray, which blends to a dilute beige intermediate color. It's not a true ring. It's blending down into that intermediate color. Um, and that's where I think the big di uh, distinction as far as reading that standard um, comes from. And if we, if we go into this understanding that they're not a, a goody animal, um, but there is intermediate, there is a transitional color before we get to that off-white, white base color, um, then I, I, I think we'll do a little bit better. Um, as far as surface color, in this poor lighting, um, uh, this, this rabbit looks pretty good to me as far as... Uh, my opinion on what uh, good Lynx Palomino color should be. Now we take it outside, take it in a little better light over on the show hall. I might change my mind a little bit, but um, we've got a nice even shade, that medium pearl gray surface color, um, I think is showing off nicely here, and evenness. Evenness is a, a big key factor on either of our varieties of Palomino, um, but I think the Lynx has a harder time with it as far as getting that. Um, let's see. 
faults on um, links, blue or black tipping on the surface, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, black tipping, you shouldn't be able to have that. Um, the, this is a dilute animal, whatever, what, what, whether you call it a, a lynx or a fawn, this is a dilute animal, so an actual true black tip color um, shouldn't, shouldn't be there. Um, but the blue, that's interesting too, because even though we don't say this is a, a lilac or blue base in the standard, um, it's obviously aiming us toward a little bit lighter shade um, to that coloration. Uh, with that fault, and I have seen there are there's not many of them, but they're floating around out there that look kind of opaly, that look really deep dark blue, almost have a true ring color to them. Um, so uh, that that fault is is there for a good reason. Um, let's see, cut severely for very dark ear lacing on either variety. That's um, I mean, again. A lot of times people blame crossing of the varieties for getting the lacing on the um, goldens, but <laughs> it happens. It happens. Um, uh, and getting that cleanliness to them on the golds is a lot harder. Um, and along those same lines, let's see if I made a note for it. Yeah. Um, one more thing that we look for on both varieties is make sure we've got nice clean foot color. We don't have the shadow bars to them. Um, those white stripey looks across the, the front. A lot of times we'll see these worse on our more washed out faded colored animals, um, but it is a pretty prevalent um, thing throughout the breed. So those are just some things. Um, again, not a very organized presentation, but uh, just pointing out some things in the standard that I think are worth the look. Um, any questions besides Al? <laughs> It's a really vague standard, probably the vaguest in terms of point allotments. Yeah. But it goes into great depth about breaking down hindquarter, midsection, and shoulder. Right. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. It, there's it, no it, point allotment so, next to it. So as a judge, do you look to other breeds as models like the California, the Champagne, the New Zealand that break those I, down as I well? I do. I do because, you know, and the breeds where we do have that broken down, it's pretty consistent where most second Third. It is, yeah. Um, so yeah, when, when in doubt, you know, use a use a breakdown. You got to come up with some logical conclusion as to why you're counting one piece of that puzzle more than the other. And I think, hey, everybody else does it, and you didn't tell us a better way to do it is a is a pretty good logical reason to do it that way. Um, and you said it's a vague, a vague stand. It actually used to be even vaguer. Really? And, um, two or three standards ago. Um, this really doesn't count for anything, but uh, we had a vote and we, we changed the color and we, last standard I think we took the picture out, which was a very flat, ugly picture. Um, but the, yeah, previously our gold, golden standard said uh, golden wheat color. Well, whose wheat are we evaluating? Depending on depending on how, how dry or, or you know your variations between regions, you're gonna have all sorts of colors of wheat. So that's a pretty um, I forget how he did it, but Tony Bell actually gave me a really good definition of what he called golden wheat, and I said that's great, but that's just a really good description of the wheat you see. That's as far as we can get it. Um, and on that vote, um, just wrap it up. Um, a good kind of a as we're we on the standards committee are starting to get votes in from our specialty clubs. Please vote in those if you're a member. Um, that those standards changes I talked about on the Palominos when we did those, um, we had nine, nine people voted that year, and we changed a document that's governing how we evaluate our breed. Um, so it, whatever breed it is, please vote in your in your uh, standards change um, elections polls. And I just have to give, not that y'all really care, but I just have to give a plug. If anybody's thinking of trying a new breed, after my Holland Lops, this is my all-time most favorite breed ever. They're a great rabbit, fun to raise, beautiful colors. I love them. And even when I sold mine, they didn't go far. They went to Colette, my best friend. And I happen to know that Mr. Joel Petrus has a soft spot for the Palomino as well. You can do meat pens with them, but in my opinion, which is worth a cup of coffee, they're a great breed, a great breed. Um, thank you, Mikey. Um, Mr. Alan Messick, who I cannot wait to hear his presentation because when I asked him what he wanted to present on, 
this is about the last breed that I thought he would ever pick. So I am so confused. Wait, I picked it? You did. I said, what do you want to do? And you said, hey, let me do AFL. And I was like, um, okay. I so totally expected you to pick like a Brit or something. I, I'm confused. So why, why'd you pick these? Because I already had the topic done. Okay, that works for me. I like that. I've been, that it totally I've been makes going sense. crazy over the last few weeks. I'm now sick as a dog. Well, we're glad I have that no you voice. want it. So. I had already had this con conference done. I wasn't actually going to admit that tonight. I wasn't going to let you all believe that I had. Oh, but it's something different, for though. Famous, but um, somebody was going to wrap me up because I did this at Ohio State Convention like 10 years ago. But I did spend my day in the airplane modifying it and updating it. And one of the things I got to do was to add the. That Fuzzy Lock won Best in Show at a convention in 2017. Previous to that, the breed actually has a, a pretty good history uh, with wins. In 2001, it won a group for youth at a convention. In 2009, it uh, won a group and opened. 2003, remember Blair Inslee? She was a, she had a, the first Best in Show at Fuzzy Lock, the 03 convention in Wichita, Kansas. And of course, California's own Lena McGee in 2017. She took it home um, back in Indianapolis. So. The breed, for um, up until the mid 2000s, was considered one of the youngest breeds. It was actually recognized in 1988, and uh, previous to that, when I got into rabbits, they were like the newest breed of rabbit. And until Triantos were recognized in 01, uh, Mini Satins in 05, and of course we've seen Lion Heads and Arjun Brun since then. So um, I still consider them kind of a new breed, but they're an established breed, and these four giant ones <coughs> really give them some credibility. Um, Look I've how young you are. There's Baby Allen. You're a baby. Baby Allen was like 12 years ago. But uh, <laughs> there was a chat this week on Facebook on the sixth class group, you know, thinking about legendary breeders that have really marked our time. This guy wasn't mentioned. Um, sadly, he, was, he died before his time. But Brian Hartzell was, um, was, an, was a rock star. He was an idol when I was growing up in Rabbits. Um, and if I had to name somebody in my lifetime that I looked up to as a kid, it was this guy. He raised amazing fuzzy lops, and as a fuzzy lop breeder of the time, um, I thought he was a god. And he also made beautiful Jersey Woolies. In fact, he recognized the broken Jersey Woolly variety, which I think Michelin back there is the variety, you know, really brought the, the breed to new levels. So anyway, I got to judge his rabbits in 08, and he won like every class, and he would be the kind of guy that would win one through like 15, and they would just be remarkable rabbits. So um, we'll never forget him. Some of us are lucky enough to have judged his rabbits in 08. Look at that, right? 1989, the very first Fuzzy Lob to invest to breed at a convention was owned by Helen McKee. She's from the Carolinas. She's still around. Some of you Jersey Woolly ladies, she's here? Yeah. No way. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh, sweetest lady. She won the very first best to breed. And that's what they looked like back then. That was taken in West Coast Classic. I think it was this year, uh, owned by Burbridge's and Green. Totally different, right? Talk about evolution of breeds. Mike brought it up. Breeds have evolved over time. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the standard changes that have reflected that. Very, very similar to what he said about the dwarf evolution, from a flat, low rabbit to a higher, more showy, showy breed. I took this question right here. Obviously, I didn't finish editing that. I meant to text it to Carol Green and find out what the, who this rabbit was, but I think it's a really contemporary photo of, of the breed today. Okay, defining breed character. I love the term breed character. We talk about it in Angora goats all the time, so I like to bring it to the rabbit house too. Is the American Fuzzy Lop a wool breed? Because you think fuzzy, it's in the name. Does wool define the breed? We're gonna spend more time talking about that in a second, but I wanna show you this. Oh yeah, we're gonna do this first. Okay, these are wool breeds, right? English Angora, 57 points on wool. French Angora, 55 points on wool. Giant Angora, 55 points on wool. Satin Angora, 60 points on wool. More wool points than any other breed, by the way. Jersey Woolly, I'm judging the national show with Scott. Scott tomorrow, 27 points on wool. Still about a third of the standard, right? Ah, okay, they don't have wool, but they are the, the highlight of my life. Angora goats, 50 points on mohair when you look at their standard, okay? Those are wool animals that are commercially viable. That is a preface to this. Carol Green made this chart a bunch of years ago. I think it, she's a scientist, so she makes everything just tangible. I saw this in, a, in one of her conferences. I was like, oh my God, Carol, I'm stealing this. So all credit goes to Dr. Carol Green, 
long time fuzzy lap breeder, but look at this. The big points are right here. Is wool one of them? No, it's a small part. It is a rabbit with wool. It's not a wool rabbit. Okay? Well, let's go back. I want to not, not too carry away. Do you see this right here? This is a big part. This is breed character right here. It's the head. In fact, the breed is called the head of the fancy. No breed in our standard gets more points on the head than the American Fuzzy Lob. It is tied with the number of points for body, which is also 30 points. So significant points here and on the body. The head of the fancy is the breed motto. If you're a member of the Fuzzy Lop Club, it's on all of their guidebooks and magazine publications for years. No wonder why, 30 points. Again, no breed gets more points on it. Look at that head. That's breed character. When you see that, you know that's a Fuzzy Lop. That is a gorgeous, gorgeous head. So that makes me want to fall in love with a breed. So Back Fuzzy Lop's not just a woolly Holland. It's a Fuzzy Lop. It's a Fuzzy Lop. It's its own breed. They're, they're, their own definition. Gotcha. I, but I actually think their history has something to do with the, the standard problems that we're talking about in a second, the old standard problems. Um, to make fuzzy lops, it wasn't the simple fact of breeding an Angora rabbit to a holland lop like it was debated. No. Any holland lop breeders in the room? Over here, right? Have you ever seen a fuzzy lop in your barn, even though if you don't raise fuzzy lops? Absolutely. Because they just pop up, right? Yeah, I don't get it. Yeah, I don't get it. She's lying. A holland lop breeder's famous last words. I've never had a fuzzy lop born in my barn. Um, <laughs> In the 80s, when the Holland Lops were being developed, Fuzzy Lops were popping up in litters. They were consistent. Patty Green Carl got the breed recognized in 88. Um, I think in those days, we were really keen on breed division and separation and uniqueness. It's a very American kind of thing to do. So the breed said, all right, we're going to be this brand new breed. We're going to be really different than Holland Lops. Well, I hate to tell you, but they're like twin sisters, except that there's a little bit of wool. It's like, we'll look at their head. <coughs> All right, we'll talk about that in a second. But 30 points on head, we'll go back to this. It's undeniable. There are three parts to the head. In any breed, if you're going to talk about head, by the way, any breed that has points on head has three components. Size, shape, and set. I like numbers. I'm a really bad math person, but numbers, for me, help me to understand things better. If you take 30 points, I like to divide them by three and give each 10 points. That's not in the standard. It can be debated, you can argue with me, and that's totally fine. But for me, that's how I give the, those components each their own, their own merit. Um, so when judges say, you know, the animal has a good head, it's not really doing it enough credit. There's 30 points. It's like taking satin fur and being able to evaluate it on the texture, the length, the length of the guard hairs, the presence of the guard hairs, the proportion of the guard hairs, the sheen, okay? Those things go into depth when you talk about satin fur, right? The same kind of energy should be given towards evaluating a fuzzy lop's head. Component one, size. The head, this is a direct quote from the standard on page 65. The head shall be massive in appearance. It is what you see. In the late 90s, when I got into rabbits, I was at a midnight show in Massachusetts, uh, the area where I grew up, and I remember I bumped into a carrier of uh, fuzzy lops owned by Sandy Noonan. She was one of the breed matriarchs. And oh my, I fell in love. I had to, I had to have this breed after I saw them because they were like Persian cats in a carrier. Those heads were huge, like grapefruits, pushed in faces, and then kind of wool. Like their, their heads were so big that you could barely even see the wool. I don't think you see those fuzzy lops anymore. But in those days, the head size really mattered. And I still think it matters today because the standard hasn't changed in that regard. But it needs to be massive. Look at this picture right here. It's an old photo, actually. I think it's one of Brian's. Um, that massive head and a short, compact body. There's no doubt about it. The head has mass. It's powerful. Um, sometimes we talk about head to body proportion. One part head, two parts body. Who's ever heard a judge call the head hunter? If you raise holland lops, dwarfs, jersey woolies, fuzzy lops, like if you're really going to be really mean and critical, you go, oh, someone says a headhunter. Okay, that's not a nice thing to say, but in a breed with 30 points on head, it's our obligation, is it not? If you call me a headhunter and I'm judging fuzzy lops, I'll probably kiss your feet. Here's that one to uh, two part ratio. You've got one part head to two parts body. This really kind of makes it all into a more of a visual. Number two component when it comes to head is the shape. Direct quote from the standard, the head shall have good width beginning at the base of the ears 
oops, beginning at the base of the ears, and carry down between the eyes to a well-filled muzzle. So if you want to talk about the parts of the head, you have the brow here, you have between the eyes, and then you have the lower muzzle, sometimes we call them the cheeks, same thing. Um, even really good heads can be faulted. Look at this one, it starts off with good width of brow and curvature, but then it gets narrower here between the eyes and then fills out with a really beautiful fat face or a lower cheek and muzzle. Third, mm -hmm. that should be number two, we're still in shape. Um, we talked about depth to width ratio. Mike talked about it when he did his talk, meaning that if you have um, depth of body, it should equate to width of body. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Or if you have width of body, it should equate to its depth of body. So depth should equal width. We talk about that body type. We don't often talk about it in a head. But when you think about it, when you have a rabbit that's equal in depth and width, you get roundness. The same thing actually happens with a head. If the head is to be round, then the point from the brow to the base of the mouth should be equidistant from the width of the head front on between the eyes. This gives a round appearance. So these are equal distance, depth equals width. So depth of head equals width of head. It's not something we talk about, but I, but I, 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 I talk about it. But I think it could be used actually in a lot of breeds where you talk about roundness of head. Dwarfs, Jersey Woolies, Holland, and Fuzzy Love all have round heads where the depth equals the width of the head. And it gives that, look at that gorgeous face. Is that not a Fuzzy Love face? It really is pretty. That should make anyone fall in love with Fuzzy Love. Uh, more on shape. Look at this head. It's deeper than it is wide, therefore it is square or maybe rectangular in shape. I tried to find the ugliest head possible. Thank you, Google Images, for this really okay, wretched did. fuzzy lock. Yeah. You succeeded. Yeah. <laughs> you could probably, <laughs> you could probably like a horse put today. tulips in with that trowel of a head. It's yeah. really, really bad. It has no curvature. It's super long. You see the eyes when you look at it from the front. A really good fuzzy lop head when you look at it front on, like a hollow lop, you won't even see the eyes because the head is so massive, they have so much width between the eyes. Uh, Jersey Woolies as well. So some, some really negative words, long, plain, and overall lacks roundness because it doesn't have that depth width ratio of, of width of head versus the height or the depth of the head. Shape again, I spend a lot of time talking about shape because shape really is a, a really iconic feature of the breed. From the profile side, this is the profile side, you want to see curvature from the brow or the you know, top of the head, over the brow, nose, and then into the lower cheeks. If this you know, shape continued, it would really be a circle. <coughs> this one, zero curvature, it's very sharp. Um, we hear the word promising a lot. I'm not a fortune teller, so I hate using the word promising when I judge. But this rabbit will never have a promising head. I don't care if you're a genie in a bottle um, and you really think that it's, it's just not yeah. ever going to be promising. It's always going to be an angular, long, flat head. This one, on the other hand, is a junior, probably the same age. You can see the curvature in the breed character about the skull and the brow, the cheeks, right? So even juniors can have good head size and shapes. The same goes for does. That statement should really follow that. that Juniors and female rabbits or animals tend to be considered lesser when it comes to head shape and size, but in actuality, they can excel in those, in those regards. Set is probably the, one of the most debated topics. Um, previous to the 2006 standard, the body description of a uh, fuzzy lob read like a Florida white, like verbatim. Rise from the base of the ear to the top of the hip, and I mean, it was a very extreme top line. All well and good, right? You can say that Helen's fuzzy law from 1988, well, it didn't have that kind of top line. I mean, it could have had that ability because its head was low. The problem is that in the head description, it described a high headset. Okay, put in context. Take a Florida white, say, remember a Fibber Biggie Florida white, like super deep, and then put the head high on its body. Do you have a top line that rises like Florida White? No. So for 15 years, the breed existed with a huge controversy. It called for a head up here, like a hollow lob, and a body like a Florida White. So uh, in 06, standard changed, thank God, and it now calls for a medium headset. 
makes sense. You can still see a bit of rise, like this one right here. This is uh, Clara Hill, she's from California, she won Best in Show with a lion head last year at the convention. She also raises gorgeous fuzzy lops. Um, and I love this photo because it's obviously got a high head set. There's no doubt about that, right? But you can actually see a little bit of rise here too. So in a hollow lop, you would see a level top line, yeah. correct, and a high head set. In a fuzzy lop, you see an elevated head with still some rise in top, okay? And uh, the, the exact wording is the head shell set close and of medium height on the shoulder. Uh, in other words, high head set. So it's not a hollow lop and it's not a mini lop. Mini lop being low head set, hollow lop being high head set. So my personal debate is, well, if you have a low head set, do you fault its head or do you fault the shoulder that's created the head to be low? Does that make sense? <coughs> so my interpretation is, well, the head is described in terms of placement and height in the head description, not in the body. And I looked at the body description, I'll show you the quote in a second, but um, it says that the basically the hips should rise slightly from the shoulders. So yes, a low shoulder will give you a low head set, so you can fault it there. But in essence, for me, the, the big thing, set, head set, is something that we fault in the head standard, okay? So the head shell set, close, and of medium height on the shoulder. Actually, the body description is the shoulders are slightly less wide, less deep. It's a little more vague. Does that make sense? You know, what, what, do you, what do you fault, the shoulder that makes it low or the head that's actually not high? But I think it's the head that's not high. So in other words, you fault the head which is set, which is the third component of head. Here's one that's too high. I mean, if you took the wool out of this, it would look like a really cute hollow lop, right? Mm -hmm. No wonder the breed developed from the hollow lop. Um, this is like old school fuzzy lop right here. This is what my fuzzy lops look like. Low head set. This is not a Fibber McGee Florida white top line, but you can see that this is the body type that the old standard described, that there was this very clear rise in top line. Now imagine putting the head up here. You wouldn't see that. So the old standard, thankfully, we're over that. But I still bring it up because it was painful. And the Jersey Woolies, right, ladies, kind of went through the same thing up until recently. So it's more defined now. Remember, Amber, you get, we've all had chats about this at the table. Uh, but those kind of things, when, when those, are, those are big deals in a breed standard. When they're written wrong, they, they throw not only the judges off, but they throw what the breeders are trying to do back home in their barn because they're trying to come up with something that the judges are all going to come to consensus on, and none of the judges could. Um, body, short coupled and close, compact. It's a, it's, a, it's a compact body. I love this photo. It's also a Brian Hartzell rabbit. It won best of breed at the 06 convention. Big old head, short compact body. You can see the gradual rise in top line, exhibiting a medium head set. High point over the loin, like I think we counted it. I went through the standard recently, it's like 35 breeds actually define where the high point should be. It's no different. Body falls really flat, oh my gosh, clearly. Peaks too early, like in the center of its back, never a good thing. We went, some of the other conferences tonight really uh, poignantly uh, describe those things. And you know, the rabbits, we're not comparing rabbits to giraffes or rabbits to gerbils, right? They're all rabbits, so we can learn from other talks because we're all speaking the same language, we're all speaking rabbits. Peaking too early and long and flat never go for most breeds of rabbit. Um, feet and legs, so bone oh, does wow. not get a lot of, no, it's good, I'm glad it's naked. It gets only five points, but bone has a lot to do with mass, power, head shape. Fine bone fuzzy lops will not have or exhibit the massive skull and that power that, that we fall in love with with the breed. So we look at bone and the front legs primarily to check that, and that's legs are going to be uh, short and thick, like a hollow lop, right? Short and thick. Exactly, like bear paws, I like to say, bear paw front legs. Or tree stumps. I think Chris Emmy says tree stumps. It's a good analogy. Oh, and by the way, I like it if naked because you can actually see uh -huh. the bone without the fur effect. Mm -hmm. They have normal fur in their front feet and legs. It's a DQ if they have wool from the ankle joints and tips of the toes. So this one has no fur at all, not even wool, but, mind you, but you can still appreciate the diameter of the bone. Posing, 
It's a natural um, pose, it's pretty basic. Medium headset, you don't want to jack them up so that they become a full arch breed. Um, the wool hides things, so if you really jack them up, you get my headset, and you think, wow, this is a really high headset, fuzzy love, I just love it. Well, put your hand under its body to make sure that you don't have this six inches of daylight, pretty much, and you have a full arch breed at that point. So wool can hide things, including um, what you're trying to do when posing. Here's one that's too high. It's a beautiful rabbit, but it's a little bit too high, and then you've got this level top one, like, oh, I'm not too low right there. That's like old school body type. That's what my fuzzy looks look like. Really low, really old school. Uh, back to the naked picture. Because of the, the false headset, you know, like I just said, you can really make a headset by posing, and then the wool covers it, unless you're naked. If you're naked, then you can see that it, well, you've got daylight here. And this is really pose like uh, petite wall things. And then look at it, it destroys the body. Like the hips look really sloped. Okay. Um, ears, sister breeds, hollow lobs, like the same thing, you know. Um, round at the tips. These are beautiful ears. Oops. By the way, they're not, I'm gonna confess, they're not fuzzy lop ears. Are they these are lop ears. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't find one good enough. Um, <laughs> so these are just aren't they gorgeous? Look how wide they are here and they're really round at their tips. Um, ears are five components, length, shape, substance, furring, and placement or set. Well furred, wow, rounded, well wop. Half inch to one inch, isn't that verbatim from home off standard two for ideal length of ear? Should be about half inch to one inch below the jawline. Now this is another thing that defines them from the hollow lob. Hollow lobs give eight points on crown. Fuzzy lobs, I don't know why, don't give any points on crown. Okay, well you can say, well then a crown's not important. Well, crown is important because a crown defines where the ear should be. The breed does fault for slipped ears. Defines what the ear base should look like. If you don't have a, a wide crown, you won't have a wide opening to your ear. Oops. You won't have a wide opening to the ear, right? If you have a very narrow crown, you'll come out of the ear base very narrow. If you come out of the ear base very narrow, what do you think happens to the rest of the ear? Folds. Looks like a tube. Folds, yes, exactly. So. I think it's kind of an injustice that the breed doesn't have points on a crown because the crown um, really is uh, influential in a lot of other things to do with the ear. If you have a tight crown, keep in mind there's no points on crown. If you have a tight crown, you get what I call fuzzy ups. Sometimes I call them holland ups and the holland ups. These are, their crown is so tight that the ears go like this. Um, so you can, of course, disqualify lock breeds with ears over the horizontal. Um, juniors are, you know, like hollow up. Juniors, they can be excitable and their crown hasn't developed yet and with, I keep talking about the crown, which gets no points, but it affects a lot of stuff. Um, so you have to give it a little more lenience to those juniors to make sure that the, they give some time to do relax. Again, crown gets no points, but it defines ear carriage, it defines ear placement, and it defines the ear base shape, which consequently defines potentially the rest of the shape of the ear. It's a wool rabbit, but not a wool breed. So wool is an adornment. It's kind of like the Jersey Woolly premise in the 80s when Bonnie Seeley made the Jersey Woolies. She wanted a little Angora that wasn't gonna take all of her night and day to keep it maintained. She could have, you know, in, in her house in New Jersey, right? Really, it's the same kind of wool. A lot of guard hair, a little coarser to the touch and it's something you don't necessarily have to groom every day. Juniors are a little different because they're softer, they're primary coats. Uh, this was also a, a Brian, oops, a Brian Hartzell rabbit. He had gorgeous wool on his rabbits. I mean, even had wool length. I remember the guard hairs would drape over the coats and just kind of caress the table. They were fabulous. You can actually see the guard hairs down here caressing the table. They were beautiful. So the wool is slightly coarser in nature, disqualifies seniors for being too soft. Um, it's okay to have some softness, of course, in juniors, and some leniency should be given to those. So where is the wool? It's uh, everywhere but the face, the ears, and the front feet. So you can disqualify for wool below the ankle joint to the toes. It's actually only a fall for wool in the ears and wool in the face, believe it or not. I don't think I've ever seen a fuzzy lop in the U.S. that had wool on the face and the ears, but if you did see it, it would not be a disqualification. It would just look really strange. In fact, it would look like this rabbit, which I found in mass population in Indonesia. It's called a teddy, 
our local breed, Scott, you've judged them before. Shirley, we've seen them. Were they in the UK? Malaysia? Yeah, no. they have in the UK. You're right. Are they called teddies there? Oh, no, I think they're, are they still cashmere's? Oh, maybe, yeah, they're cashmere. So, in other words, it's like a fuzzy lop, a low headset, but it actually has wool covering its ears and covering its face. It's just a food for thought. I thought it was a fun kind of. <laughs> they're very funny rabbits to look at, and they're in mass quantity in Indonesia. Sometimes we'll judge like 50 of them. Like, I, don't know, I don't know what to judge it on. Where's your standard? Or he's like, I don't know. You can just go in there and do it. They are kind of cute. They're very popular in pet stores. Okay, um, texture, I already said, but if it feels like too soft, like an English Angora, it should be disqualified. One of my favorite words for negative things when it comes to texture is hairy. The Jersey Woolly ladies from California know this really well. I hate hairy wool. It has like luster and no crimp and it lies flat. It's a totally just, I don't even want to touch it. But you see this, you find it really, you find it a lot in blacks and black otters. Look, do this, does it not like almost shine? Because it has so much of the wrong kind of guard hair with no crimp and undercoat to back it up. Um, it's, I'm going on and on about it. It's not a DQ, it's just undesirable. Okay. Like really undesirable. Okay. <laughs> Keeps me up at night, honestly. Uh, color is a very insignificant part of the breed. It's small stuff. I think for people studying for their tests, or if you're judging and you're like, you know, oh God, I don't want this variety to pass under me and I didn't see it, don't, um, you don't want to find tan pattern and you don't want to find ticked group. Those two groups are not recognized by Fuzzy Lops. That means no Otter, no Silver Martin, no Smoke Pearl Martin, no Steel. Okay, those are big varieties in, in some other breeds. You see them in Holland Lops, both of those groups. Of course you see uh, ticks in Mini Lops, French Lops, and English Lops. So those two groups are not, not Fuzzy Lops groups. I'd say maybe the biggest color topic though is stable point. If you put correct stable point, if you actually read the standard about what, it, what stable point color is on the body, it's creamy white. If you put creamy white in combination with white to make a broken stable point, okay, you're already talking like a light pattern against a white. Then put wool onto it. Wool has a finer diameter, so it mutes color, all right? This rabbit looks like it only has head markings. I can't show you, obviously, but it has pattern. It's just, has correct color. Correct stable point color in a wool braid, to put it on broken, will look nearly white, okay? I had one disqualified once, and I was so heartbroken because I love the rabbit, but it's hard to see. Good, good stable point color on white will look almost white, and therefore not uh, maintaining the 10% minimum rule for broken pattern percentage in fuzzy lobs. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I love judges' conferences. I think that more should be done. Stacy, I was bragging about Louisa <coughs> today in the car and to some other people because um, I've been coming down here for about 10 years and I think the state's really, really come up. I mean, you guys are hosting national shows now you've got judges' conferences. So I'm really proud of you guys, and I'm really glad to be here this weekend. Um, and, and of course, the food, man, you cannot get any better food than here in Louisiana. But, so thank you, Stacey, thank you. for inviting me. It was really fun. Uh, we've got a new thing going. It's called The Rabbit Show. I can see from my Facebook friend, you realize that I've been doing it like all over the world. Um, we've got lots of educational stuff coming, so keep watching. We're doing it all live stream tonight, so everyone around the world can enjoy um, what our speakers have brought to us tonight. So thank, thank you very much. You. Thank you. Um, happy to have is Cheryl Blackman. Um, Cheryl actually does have to um, take time off from her job to get here in time to help us. Um, Cheryl does a lot of mini satins, which she actually, her rabbits will stop me in my tracks. Um, I actually carried around, what was that ridiculous rabbit? Was he a chocolate black tor, a black tor? She had a black tor that I carried around the showroom almost and could not put down. Um, she sent me a picture one time that I'll never forget. I called it the precious metals because the rabbits actually looked like they glowed. Um, there was a, I think a blue tort, and I was like, oh Cheryl, it looks like it's platinum. There was a black tort that looked, oh, it's a touch screen, but I mean, my uh, mouse disappeared. Thank me. you. Sorry. Um, driving it around. Yeah, just like poke it twice and it'll open. There you go. Oh, no worries. Um, so um, I'm very happy that she's willing to come talk to us about um, mini satins. She has some amazing rabbits, some gorgeous colors that um, appeal to me very much because they look like jewelry. 
So, um, so she is going to come talk to us a little bit about those. And she is very patient with me and indulges all my little quotes and questions about her breed. I even asked her when she got back there, I said, did you, did you bring a black sword? And she goes, no. No, no, no short today. Not today, she didn't. Blue short at home, but her coat at trashed out on me, so. Gotcha. She stayed at home. Do you remember the precious metals picture? Do you remember I do, picture? I actually have it. Oh, yay. I set my stuff to any case. Got it. I put things down. Well, thank you, Stacy, for inviting me to present. Um, I, I do raise many satins. Satins were my home for almost 30 years. Uh, but in the midst of that, especially toward the tail end, I started raising mini satins. And then several years ago, we shifted from satins just to mini satins. So we have a barn full of mini satins in color, which is fun. I never thought I'd say that, but I did. <coughs> so, I mean, the basics on it, but still reminding of weights. So for seniors, you have a maximum weight of four and three quarter pounds. Please don't be afraid to put seniors on the scale, both in the minimum and the maximum. Um, we are seeing so many satins with, with insufficient bone, um, and they're just small, very small. Um, and it's very easy to see many satins go over that four and three quarters. So don't be afraid to put them on the scale. <coughs> with the last standard revision, the junior weight did go from three and three quarters to four pounds. So please make sure that you are aware of that. Um, that four pound or that quarter of a pound increase to four, uh, four pounds allows the breed to have more competitive juniors on the table. We were finding that we were having a lot of unfinished juniors um, because to keep them under three and three quarters, they were younger. So it allowed more mature animals to, to go into junior class before they were six months old. Um, and it allowed finish without having to show as a senior. So as a breeder, we appreciate it. Um, and if they're a junior that exceeds junior weight, they may show in a senior. <coughs> Looking at points, and I did add a note, we're talking about breed character and tying that back in. Many satins aren't just small satins. There are breed differences when it comes to weight or um, to the point breakdown. If you look at satins, um, and the red is the satin standard broken down. If you look at points, you for general type, you have 45 points. If you take fur and color and put that together for the coat, that's also 40 points. If you split uh, 45 points, if you split condition, you have a 50-50 animal. So 50, 50 points are, or 50% of the animal is the type, 50% is the coat. If you look at mini satins, that's not the case. For type, you have 55 points. Coming down under coat, you have 35 points. So it does shift the emphasis. Another place that the, ch the points and the emphasis changes is on head and ears. There is more points on the head and ear on a mini satin than there is on the satin. Um, so you do want to make sure that you are maintaining that dwarf breed character with that head and ear, a big thick um, ear, or a thicker ear, of well furred ear and a thicker head. Um, a lot of this is gonna echo what, I, what I've seen in other presentations. I walked in about midway on Mikey's, but echoing some of the, the comments uh, that have been made by several presentations on type, um, it is a dwarf breed, so short, close couple, deep animal with, a, with sufficient width. Um, and, but one thing I do want to point out that I see pretty often um, in a breed as a battle is top line. Because to, that building that proper top line builds a proper animal. Um, with a proper top line comes proper muscling and placement of muscling. I know these aren't many satins, but this is one of the best illustrations in the standard. And both of those are from the current standard. Um, if you look in the color portion, at the front of the standard, that's the Californian. If you look under the breed, that's the Californian. Um, and you have a rabbit that peats entirely too early and a rabbit that's much more correct, still a little forward, but a much more correct in its high point. So taking that to mini satins, that's a chocolate mini satin that peaks way too early. That's a broken back black mini satin that's much more correct in its high point. But they are to peak over the center of the hip, not the forward placement of the hip like the Palominos with Mikey's presentation, but the center of the hip. When you get that correct high point, you have sufficient loin muscling that will carry that fullness back. Rabbits that peak early tend to narrow channel and shallow over that loin, and they'll also tend to have a loin that tapers into that hind quarter. When you can push that high point back to where it needs to be, you get enough loin muscling that flanks it, and it carries a wider, fuller, smoother rabbit through the hind quarter. Head and ears on mini satins, you have more points there. You want a round, well-developed uh, head. Um, it really does showcase it. It is a dwarf breed, so that is breed character. When you see very long, snipey heads with long ears, that's your non-dwarf. 
Oh, uh, and it does have an ear length disqualification, three and a half inches. Um, and I meant to grab one on the way out, but I, of course, forgot something. That might be the one thing. I haven't figured the other, the other yet. Um, but the cage tags that have, they're the, the small rectangular cage tags that you can hang, those are actually three and a half inches. So I have one of those that sits on my grooming table, my work table, and that's what I measure ears with. Uh, do not be afraid to put a ruler between the ears and measure ears. There's a lot of mini satins across the table that are sitting an eighth inch to a quarter of an inch over, but it's deceptive. When you have a rabbit that has depth of body, it's easy to lose the length of ear perspective. So there'll be rabbits that are over an ear length, um, but because they're such a deep body, it proportionally looks like it should fit the animal. <coughs> it is a dwarf breed, um, and the dwarf gene is an important thing to point out. Um, Stacy talked about a jeweled litter. This was that litter when it got older. I have the baby picture. It's a lot cuter. Um, and that is a litter that I produce in my barn, uh, and that was one litter. But one thing I want to point out is that it is a dwarf gene, and the reason I put that picture up there is you can pick your, your dwarfs and your non-dwarfs in that litter. Um, when a rabbit gets two copies of that dwarf gene, it's a peanut and it's fatal. They don't live, or they, at least they shouldn't. But they have to have it one copy or one of that dwarf gene to show those breed characteristics. So you want them to have a dwarf gene. Um, you want them to have the, the shorter, deeper, wider, rounder head, and it brings about that shorter ear. Without that dwarf gene, you have a non-dwarf or a false dwarf, and those are the, what, you know, the normal looking rabbits. Longer ear, snipier head, five and a half to six pound animals. Not saying those aren't useful in a breeding program, but they really shouldn't be on the show table. I see lots of them as juniors on the show table, not necessarily at breed national shows, but at local shows. They'll show as juniors, but never make it to the seniors because they'll be overweight and the ears are too long. If you look through that though, you can see the length of ear on this black tort at the top. And if you compare that length of ear to the sepia Siamese or this chocolate tort, you can see the difference in ear length. Um, this little guy was a chocolate Siamese and he was also a non-dwarf. So you have three, if you can look at the length of body, it gives you some hints as well, that had the dwarf gene and then two on either end that were longer in ear. Um, Coming out of the nest box, it's hard to spot them. You give them a couple of weeks until they grow, and then you see the difference, and they're easy to pick out and pull out. They just have to hit a certain point in growth. <coughs> the fur description, um, it's a very fine, soft, silky coat. Um, you want as soft as possible. There's really not such thing as too soft of a coat. So be very careful in your descriptors on this coat structure. Um, be very thoughtful in your comments, and that's my bottom line on that, is if, you, if I have a judge who says things about my animals like it's too soft in coat, that's not possible. It's not. Use a different descriptor. It's a cottony coat. There's too much undercoat without the guard hair to support it. It's an immature coat. Young coats are very cottony. Cottony is a very different descriptor, or that, that description talking about the, the amount of undercoat is a very different descriptor than talking about an overly soft coat. So you lose some credit with satin breeders as a judge when you start talking about overly soft coats because that's not possible. Um, there should be a guard hair to support the coat. It's the guard hair that gives the coat the sheen. What's, um, the, 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 I guess the trick of it is to have the fine diameter guard hair that gives you that beautiful satin texture, you lose some of that shininess. When you see a really, really heavily sheened animal, they have a really heavy guard hair. They're gonna usually have a much coarser texture. So the diameter of the guard hair is what gives that sheen because of the satin coat structure, but it also lends toward a, a harsher coat. They also usually, those really heavily sheened animals usually have a longer guard hair, a guard hair that st stands a lot uh, higher above the undercoat, which also lends toward a coarser coat. Um, it does talk about a uniform length. You tend to see that a lot more in dilutes, um, but nonetheless, you want a uniform length, and again, that also lends toward that proper texture. Um, DQ for absence of sheen. Um, one thing I will add on coat structure, though, is it's not a rollback, it's not a flyback. Sat neither satins nor many satins stipulate that it's a flyback or a rollback coat. And there are numerous times over showing satins and many satins, and I've had judges comment that um, it's not the correct flyback coat, or it's a good flyback coat, or a good rollback coat, and a lot of breeders will stand around with a quirked eyebrow thinking, there's making things up. So that's another one of know your vocabulary when it comes to the breed and choose your thoughts carefully. There are 16 variety or variety groups within mini satins now. Um, and there's really nothing new on the horizon at this point. Um, or there's projects, but nothing that's immediately going to be presented to the standards committee. 
um, which is new. That's the first in a while that we really haven't had a whole lot going on with presentations. Um, but that being said, um, with 16 varieties, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time detailing what a black looks like because that's fairly standard. But I do want to point out within the varieties some spe specifics, peculiarities, and things to watch for. So blacks. Um, I mean, it's a fairly standard black description. Some things that I would suggest you watch for are marbled eye color. It runs rampant. Um, and blue-gray eye color. Not as often, but you do see marbled eye color. Um, there's enough other varieties, especially when you've got chins who allow the whole world in eye color, almost, that that marbled eye tends to come into play. Um, Siamese backgrounds also give blacks marbled eye sometimes. Blues. Um, and re remember with the sheen, with that, the, the, the guard hair of a satin coat and with sheen, you have a much more rich and intense color. So blues are very deep in color. Um, watch for a poor or white under color, but also watch for mis mis mismatched toenails. You usually don't see anything crazy in eye color in blues, it's usually toenails. Brokens, any variety in conjunction with white. Um, it does stipulate that it has to have, or there has to be color around the, the eyes, the ears, the nose, basically your facial markings. Doesn't disqualify for mismatched toenails. Um, it does disqualify for less than 10%, but not disqualifying for over 50. So we, we don't mind heavy patterns in the mini satin crowd, or the satin crowd for that matter. Um, do watch for excessive scattered white hairs. Steels exist. Silver tip steels exist. So you'll get a rabbit that looks like a broken, but it's steeled in its pattern. Very Lots, lots of guard, uh, scattered white hairs in its broken pattern. And that's where you're looking for steels. Um, also, and I didn't necessarily mention this, but there's broken pointed white or broken Himalayan animals exist. So if you get an animal that looks like it doesn't have any color on the back, be a little wary of that too. Uh, chinchilla. <coughs> a couple of things to point out. Uh, is with the last standard, the eye color expectations changed as well. So anything but pink flies. So you can have brown, you can have blue, gray, and you can have marbled eye color <coughs> in the chinchillas. That's satins and many satins now. The DQ is for the extremes in color, extremely dark, extremely light, um, the brown tinge, the brassiness. Um, but do not, certain, dis, there's a peculiar disqualification, or not peculiar, but specific disqualification of not disqualifying for, or do not disqualify for absence of blue under color on any portion of the tail. Well, that was interesting and false. Um, chocolate, and that is a chocolate animal. Just remember with Sheen, it makes it dark. So you have really deep, rich color. Um, guys do not have to have a ruby cast. It calls for brown with ruby cast, but it's not a disqualification if it's not present or if you don't see it. You have three agouti varieties. You have the copper, um, which is comparable to your chestnut agouti. You have a chocolate agouti, and you have your opal, which is your blue. Um, I basically gave your three of them in comparison through the next couple of slides. So there's your black, there's your chocolate, and there's your blue. And if you look at the descriptions of them, they're all very similar in wordings. It just changes the color descriptors a bit. So you go from the undercolor of chocolate, sorry, um, with slate blue, uh, with copper of slate blue, chocolate of the, the dove gray, opal of slate blue. So the wording of the three standards are very, very similar. It just changes the color intensities throughout. Orange versus fawn, um, the, the black, the chocolate, the blue. Um, so I really in this wanted to point out that the verbiage is very similar. It just changes slightly when it turns to the intensity based on the three varieties. Um, for, um, and I will give full credit to Melissa McGee, I hope she's watching. Um, there was a conversation at one point whenever the chocolate agoutis were coming out of how do you tell the difference? How do you tell the difference between a chocolate agouti um, and a copper? Or for instance with Rex, how do you tell the difference between an amber and a caster? And Melissa McGee and I in conversation, she's mentioned this and it's really stuck with me. You look at the top of the tail. The top of the tail is brown, if you have a chocolate based animal, if it's black, you have a black based animal. So if you're trying to tell whether you have an amber versus a, a caster or a chocolate agouti versus a copper, look at the top of the tail. It's sometimes you can really see it on the, the lacing of the ears, but the top of the tail is a really, really easy, good place to check in on. And that just runs through the rest of it. Uh, disqualifications for copper, it's your extremes and colors, kind of like your chinchillas. Um, for your chocolate agouti and your opal, it's the absence of ring color. Um, 
And then for coppers, it's not a disqualification for absence of blue under color on the pail. Himalayans, and I happened to glance over and see Mike over there. I almost felt like you should come do this portion of it because he's very instrumental in bringing this to our club. Um, they've shown as a group black, blue, chocolate, and lilac. Um, you, it's all of your point color. Um, be aware that um, the toenails can be light or dark as long as they match. So if you have dark, light, dark, dark, that would be a mismatched toenail situation. But if they're all uniformly lighter showing pigment, that's perfectly acceptable. It just needs to show pigment. Um, with any pointed white animal, Californians, Himalayans, watch for white or mismatched toenails um, and smut. Mike, do you see smut very often on them? I was thinking. I was thinking as I was writing that in there that I don't see very many of them. I don't know that I've seen, but maybe one or two on the show table ever with it. Otters is another shown in groups: black, blue, chocolate, and lilac. It's pr pretty consistent with a lot of other breeds when you're talking about otters. Um, if blacks and chocolates will have orange markings, blue and lilac will have fawn markings. Um, belly and nostrils. Um, it's very consistent with the rest. Um, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that. Um, I've seen one instance of marbled eye on a black otter, but I haven't really noticed a whole lot um, either in raising or in judging otters with odd eye colors. Reds, um, a very even color, flame red orange, running deep down toward the skin. You want that color to run as close to, to the skin as you can down the hair shaft. Um, that, again, it goes to intensity. You will have smutty reds, but very clean reds are incredibly possible. And those are two incredibly, incredibly clean reds. I do want to point out one thing on it, though. Look at the length of ear and head on this one. You have a rounder head and a shorter, thicker ear. Look at the length of ear on that one. So that one is probably your non dwarf. You can kind of spot them as you go. Uh, reds are, the toenails are to show color. Again, you would disqualify for mismatch, fault for take, uh, ticking, fault for a little smuttiness. Um, but as a red variety, it's not uncommon. But clean is out there. <coughs> Siamese is another group. Um, I would love to say black, blue, chocolate, lilac, but if you look at the wording of the standard, it's actually sepia, not black. So it's a sepia animal, a blue, a chocolate, and a lilac. Um, so it's not a true black, it's just a really deep dark brown with <coughs> sepia. Um, things to watch for, or things to know that they do appear in blue and lilac. Um, they're just not as common on the table. Um, watch for marbled eyes, especially on the sepias. It runs rampant. It's horrible and very hard to get rid of. I raise them and it's miserable. Um, things to know from, the, I guess, the judge's perspective, but it ties back to the breeder's perspective. There is a very direct correlation to texture and the depth of color. An animal that is going to be a little bit lighter across the saddle with a little bit cleaner shadings to there, but that lighter saddle color will lend toward a, a cleaner texture, a more proper texture. The darker the shading, the coarser the texture almost every time. So for the deeper, darker, richer, almost kind of that yellowy, deep peanut butter with the heavier shadings, those animals usually have a much harsher texture than the ones who are lighter. I don't breed for color with my Siamese, I breed for texture. So when I walk through the barn, I look for anything that was going to be a darker animal and I have one and it's an older brood doe and she's just gotten smuttier as the years have gone on and she's molted several times. Um, but the majority of my, like I said, I don't breed for color. I don't really cull for color that way. They just all lend in that direction because I cull hard for, for, for texture on coat. Um, one thing that I do want to point out is the different colors other than sepia, they aren't necessarily rare, I would say, but they aren't super common. Um, this is one that I did produce and I really wish that before I got rid of or sold him that I got better pictures of him. Um, he was a lilac Siamese, but he was a lilac Siamese with a whole lot of depth of color. So when he was sitting, he went to our breed nationals, not this year, but the year before, and it was a, quite a conversation down there. And then when the, the Siamese were on the table, several people were asking, what color is that rabbit? Because they thought he was a tort. He was in fact a lilac Siamese. So because I'm judging a mom often puts the rabbits on the tables and I make sure she is well versed on what color he is for people who ask, but also that, so that if a judge decides to disqualify him, that she'll have words to back herself up on it. Um, but do know that they do exist. They just look a little goofy, I suppose. Uh, he was actually a beautiful animal. He just didn't fit with what I needed for my breeding program. So he lives with somebody else now. Um, but they do exist. 
They're just not super, super common out there. <coughs> lighter or dark toenails are permitted. On your darker shaded animals, you'll usually see darker toenails. On the lighter animals, such as this one, you're gonna see a lighter toenail color. As long as they match, you're good to go. Um, you can have darker on the hind and lighter on the rear. It's not saying that all four feet have to match. It's the same foot and corresponding foot. So if you have light, light and dark, dark, that's totally permissible. Um, again, watch for a marbled eye color. It runs rampant in the Siamese. Silver Martins are again grouped black, blue, chocolate, and lilac. Nothing really all that special about that one in comparison to other breeds that have that variety. Again, watch your mismatched toenails or incorrect eye color. Squirrels are a newer variety. It's a blue chinchilla. So if you take the chin standard, basically convert it over to blue, they read very similarly. Um, absence of ring color and brown patches are going to be um, disqualifications. Um, what I find in the squirrel, especially because you have a guard hair that approximates the length of the undercoat, is that the surface tends to be fairly uniform in color, but they do have that ring, um, ring color in there. Um, they're quite striking, very pretty animals. Torts are also shown as a group, black, blue, chocolate, and lilac. Um, those, you'll, you'll see the different shadings of them besides black more often in torts than you do in Siamese. Um, uh, I, I raised torts as well, and I don't really get funny eye colors in them very often, so I didn't really even mention it here. Um, whites, white animal. Um, red eyes, pink eyes. Um, but it kind of runs back to a few comments on knowing the vernacular of the breed or really knowing how to sound smart as a judge. So I always kind of end my presentation on either satins or mini satins with this and it's talking about breed specific or breed relevant comments, um, also known as how to make yourself sound smart as a judge. Um, this is that same litter that I pointed out earlier. Oh, I just realized that the colors are reversed top to bottom. Um, so kind of running through the colors on it, it's a black tort, it's a blue tort, and a chocolate tort. It's a sepia Siamese, it's a lighter one, and that's a chocolate Siamese. Um, and you can see the difference between tort and Siamese on that. You can also start seeing, like with this little guy, he ended up being one of my little non dwarfs look how long his ears are. So you can start seeing that more, the older they get in their nest box. That was one doe. She produced Skittle litters every single time. It was kind of fascinating for me. She's a very consistent producer, makes pretty animals too. Um, sheen, <coughs> in the vein of how to sound smart as a judge when it comes to satin breeds, please don't comment heavily on sheen. Please don't tell me I need to work on sheen. It's either there or it's not. Disqualify it for not absence of sheen, but when you start praising sheen, you are typically praising a harsher coat. Um, if you are telling me to go home and work on sheen, you're telling me to go home and work on something that I don't work on. Mike, do you have a breed for Sheen? No, satin breeders don't. It's either there or it's not. Um, and so it's, it, it's one of those things that from the satin breeder perspective, when we have judges who start harping on Sheen and going crazy talking about so much beautiful Sheen or lack of Sheen, it's really just kind of showing a little bit of na uh, the naive attitude toward the, the guard hair and the coat structure. Color saturation, know that with that, the Sheen and with the satin coat, Color saturation is intense. So you have things like torts that are really, really deep and rich, and that's because of sheen. So make sure you know the difference. Make sure you can tell the difference between a blue tort and a blue Siamese, between a lilac tort and a lilac Siamese. It makes you sound very knowledgeable as a judge. Texture, again, don't ever tell me that my coat is too soft. It's meant to be. Find other words and vocabulary to describe it. Um, I, it doesn't hurt my feelings if you talk about a junior coat being a little cottony because if there's a lot of undercoat without the developed guard hair, that one's not necessarily an offensive. But if you start saying that my coat is too soft, that's kind of a slap in the face. In return of coat, don't harp on, on a flyback or a rollback because our breed standard doesn't say it. And those are some things that tend to be, I guess, I don't want to say things that stick for satin breeders, but those are things that from the satin breeder perspective or mini satin breeder perspective, that gives you some credibility as a judge toward the breeders um, if you kind of stick with the vernacular of the breed. And I think that goes with any breed, knowing the specific breed relevant comments make you sound smart as a, as a judge as well. Um, I did at the break, if you want, I did bring a couple of animals if you want to look at some differences in coat structure and feel some texture. I want to. Um, I'm happy to, to put them up for a little bit of a Show and tell, touch and feel, something of that nature. Awesome. Questions?
Mike, anything you want to add? Yes. When, and what I also tell people is, I mean, when I stroke a coat, I basically let the coat run through your hand. I want it to, it's like air. It's like a whisper of air on my hand. I don't want to feel it at all, really. That's a really proper texture. When you can feel it, that's when you're creeping toward harsh. So you want it to just, I mean, literally be like a whisper along your hand. Um, if you're really having to dig in and feel it, it's really lending toward harsh. Are the varieties and their... Um, corresponding to texture similar with satins. So there are certain varieties that are generally softer, more mm -hmm. correct in texture than others. Like blues versus blacks, your dilutes typically have a much cleaner texture, tend to lend toward that proper texture. Um, your like like blues versus blacks, if, even within torts, I've noticed that my dilute torts have a cleaner texture. Um, it's it's it, it, but some of it is also the bloodlines that made it up and the length of that guard hair. Um, with whites, you have very like polar ends of it. You have a heavier guard hair, a little harsher coat, a lot of sheen, and you have that more refined guard hair and that softer coat. So. Which varieties struggle most with texture? Your goodies. I, I mean, I really, especially coppers. I think, um, I think chocolates and the I think your chocolate goodies are a little are are a little bit better, um, but I think that that just kind of lends toward it. And, uh, but I'll also add some of your varieties that aren't as frequently worked on. You don't have as many people breeding them like reds. Um, it just doesn't have the pool of breeders underneath it. So it doesn't have quite the gene pool and it doesn't have quite the focus from, from the widespread medium. Thank you. So, any others? Thank you. Sure thing. a whole 15 minute break but I know you're getting tired but if anybody wants to potty or grab a drink I want to feel Cheryl's rabbits and then we'll do a Scott and a Scott and a Joel and we'll be finished for tonight.